You're looking at one of the world's most renowned race tracks. It's Watkins Glen International in upstate New York. The Glen, as it's known, is home for round 10 of the Rolex Sports Car Series. And the teams come here after enduring a wet and wild ride at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway just two weeks ago. It's a real treat for us to say, for the first time in this series, welcome to the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. This is going to be a tough race. There are championships on the line. Look at this. Oh, oh they touch. That's done. Problems with the lead of the 01. Roas is around down in turn one. Look at this. What a move. Ooh, that was close. These guys have been crazy here under the yellow. There's DL. Oh, my goodness. This is massive in the championship. Getting all the way off on the grass. Just keep on me. When JPM gets behind the wheel of Kelvin <laughs> amongst the pigeons. I, I don't even know what to say. Oh, contact there. Yeah. Retribution for that hit earlier. You didn't take Nostradamus to tell you Montoya's going to take somebody out. Sebastian Bourdain, Alex Popov, victorious at the first ever Rolex Series race at Indianapolis. There's always a huge buzz to come to Watkins Glen each August and share the track with NASCAR's Sprint Cup and Nationwide Series. There's lots going on at the Glen and there's plenty to drive for as this championship enters the final four races. And speaking of championships, no one knows how to win more than this man, Scott Pruitt, the series' only four-time Daytona prototype champion, and his good mate and co-driver, Mamo Rojas. He has three championships of his own. They lead the Daytona prototype point standings. And how about these guys in GT? Jeff Siegel and Emil Asentado, the reason why they're smiling, they sit atop the GT standings. Real pleasant to say welcome to Watkins Glen. Lee Diffie along with Dorsey Schrader and Calvin Fish. And there is plenty going on here right now because we've got Grand Am drivers doing double duty in both the Nationwide Series and Sprint Cup. There's a wonderful atmosphere here this year. And there's something really special about this place and this series because they, they marry together very well. We always seem to produce very exciting racing here, like the Salem six hours of the Glen just recently. A six hour race was decided by just two tenths of a second when the checkered flag fell. But we change gears. We look at this one today, Cal. Very different story. Absolutely, Lee. This is a crucial stage in this championship year. You know, we're reaching the final stretch of races, returning to the Glen for the second time in two months. But very different dynamic to the six hours there, which was just six weeks ago. This is a two-hour flat-out sprint race. And for the drivers today, when they jump in the cockpits of the race cars, it's like jumping onto a bullet train. It's flat-out action all of the way. And Dorsey, we do it at a racetrack, the short course here, where the speeds are just unbelievable. Well, the short course here at Watkins Glen is actually the fastest average speed track we run at at 134 miles per hour there's nowhere on this racetrack you go slow you got to look at the big picture knowing next week we go to Montreal if you get off this racetrack it's going to be a big accident and it will impact the championship you've heard the boys say we're entering the final four races we're going to talk a lot about points and here we go in Daytona prototypes or DP as you hear us refer to them as you got Rojas and Pruitt with the largest leading margin they've had this season it's out to 11 points but keep in mind that you get 35 for the win what are the Daytona prototype storylines coming into this 10th round here they are when Juan Pablo Montoya and the Ganassi 02 controversially collided with the Starworks Ford in Indianapolis, it had a big impact on regular season driver and team point standings. Ryan Dial and Enzo Podolicchio finished a lap down in seventh place, while the Ganassi team car of Scott Pruitt and Mamo Rojas claimed the runner-up spot. The incident still has Starworks owner Peter Barron seething. The last time we were at Watkins Glen for the six-hour race in early July, Alex Gurney in the number 99 was leading late, until Joao Barbosa in the number 9 Corvette took took advantage of GT traffic and made a spectacular pass of Gurney that would result in victory. This weekend, Barbosa's number five sister car is also in the headlines as it will be driven by David Donahue and 21-year-old Jordan Taylor making his prototype return with the Action Express team. The youngest of the Taylor boys has made his mark in Grand Am's GT division driving Camaros where he has two wins. He also has competed with Team Chevy at Le Mans. Well, Ryan Dial and Enzo Podolicchio were second in the Daytona Prototype Drivers' Championship leaving Indianapolis, and when they came to Watkins Glen, the only thing that's different is Enzo Podolicchio is not here. His frustration bubbled over after Indianapolis and has decided not to return to the Rolex Sports Car Series this year. That left Peter Barron's Starworks team in a bit of a bind. 
Sebastian Bourdais will partner with Alex Popoff. They won at Indianapolis, but what about Ryan Dial? Well, they needed to find him a new dance partner. They did in the form of Lucas Lohr, so he will fill in this weekend. And if Ryan Dial wants to win this Daytona Prototype Drivers Championship, he'll have to get past a pretty familiar foe, Chris. Well, Brian, the dust is definitely not settled between Ganassi and Starworks. These two teams, still a lot of controversy persists, even though that contact was between Juan Pablo Montoya in the 02 and Ryan DL, but it's the championship that's on the line. And speaking with Peter Barron earlier, he said he's told his drivers if they are trying to work their way around the 01, and if there's any daylight, his drivers had better pull the trigger and go for the pass. If there's contact and they get a penalty because of that contact, he says he will happily serve it. Speaking with team manager Tim Keene and Scott Pruitt on the 01, one. They said that they're expecting these last four races to be some of their toughest races they've ever tried to win a championship for because of the controversy with the Starworks team, but also the 10 and the 99. They're essentially out of this championship, and those two teams still just going for wins. That is exactly right, Chris. That's what the 10 Wayne Taylor SunTrust team is focused on, and his 23-year-old son, Ricky, put this familiar car in a very familiar position. On the pole here yesterday with a stunning lap that gave the team a real nice uh, morale boost after the trouble they've endured this year. And they're feeling pretty high on things after being on the podium. And it's not just about Ricky, it's about his 21-year-old brother Jordan as well, because Jordan transitions from Jeep T to DP here. Yeah, two very impressive young men, both on and off the racetrack. It'll be fascinating today to see them do battle now in the same class of racing. I wonder how nervous Dad is. <laughs> Brian Till can tell us more. Well, remember, it was just last year at the six hour here at Watkins Glen where Ricky Taylor, Jordan Taylor were on poles in their respective classes, but Wayne, They've returned both to Daytona prototype. This time, Jordan has a really good shot with a really good team, Action Express. How nervous are you? How proud of you are on what these boys have accomplished? Yeah, it's just amazing. You know, Ricky being on the pole and uh, Jordan having this opportunity with Action. Um, I'm not sure really how I should be feeling. I'm obviously excited for them. I'm proud of them both. Um, one of them's not going to be happy at the end of the day, but, you, you know, but uh, what's the alternative? So I think, I think it's a great opportunity for all of them. Great opportunity indeed. Wayne Taylor, once the green flag drops, will be on pins and needles, guys. And a lot of drivers, a lot of their peers in this paddock are quite proud of those two young guys from Florida. We encourage you to join the conversation. Remember, hashtag GA on speed. There are our respective Twitter handles. We love to hear your thoughts on what you see and what you think. We've got you up to speed on the Daytona prototype class. It's time when we come back to talk about GT. And everybody wants to win at the Glen. Why? Because this place is just steeped in history and the legends have graced these hallow grounds. Speed's coverage of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series is presented on speed by Rolex. Brought to you in part by Subaru. Experience the confidence of symmetrical all-wheel drive. What a beautiful place it is to be at this time of the year. And let's talk and let's speak more specifically, Dorsey. Let's take a look at where we are, Google Earth. Brought to us by BMW. Well, we're in upstate New York. You see Rochester up north, Syracuse there. Those are the Finger Lakes. This is the Finger Lakes region. We're on the short course, 2.45 miles in length, 11 corners. This is the fastest average speed course. Fast and busy, that's the way to look at it. We showed you the Daytona prototype points. Let's get you up to date with the GT points. And it's a very similar story because it's the largest lead margin. And that's boasted by Emil Asentado and Jeff Siegel. We saw them a little earlier in the show. And now, What's the state of play in GT? Here are the storylines. Stevenson Motorsports' Robin Liddell is second in driver points in the 57 Camaro, but suffered a DNF at Indy. However, he and co-driver John Edwards have high hopes for this race, as they were victorious at Watkins Glen earlier this year. Masters have won the sprint race here two of the last three years. Might this be a good omen for the third place number 70 Speed Source team? Driver Sylvain Tremblay and Jonathan Barmorillo last visited Victory Lane at Barber Motorsports Park in March. Tied for third is Paul Dallalana, driver of the 94 BMW. His Turner Motorsports team is on a roll. They've won Mid-Ohio and have placed top five or better in each of the last eight Rolex Series races. 
FXDD, AIM Autosport. They lead the GT Championship with Jeff Siegel, Emil Asentado, and they lead in their Ferrari. They've got three victories in GT on the year. So does Fernando Alonso. And you've got to think, maybe with the summer break that Formula One is experiencing right now, Alonso leading that championship, just like Siegel and Asentado are. With the summer break in Formula One, maybe the guys in Marinello today sitting back and watching the Rolex Sports Car Series to see if the 69 can come away with a fourth victory on the season. Chris? Well, Brian, we always know it's Eric Kern and Boris said in the wheeling Corvette, but because of an ankle injury last year, Joey Logano was subbing for Eric Kern, and he quickly adapted to that Corvette in qualifying. He put it up into the top spot, but on the very next lap, Joey Logano loses it over the carousel and hits the wall hard, having to go to a backup car that weekend. This year, the team has been very fast, but they just haven't been able to get the results. They need the speed, but they also need to convert. They finally have a good qualifying session. Boris said yesterday, putting the 31 car on pole, getting that much closer to their first podium of the year. This team's best finish in 2012, seventh. We wish them well. They're certainly in a very strong position. Hey, speaking of strong, what about Team Salem? The Salem's organization is legendary in this part of New York. There's Joe Salem, the man behind the name. They're switching next year from GT competition to Daytona prototypes with a pair of BMW-powered Rileys. That is great news for the series. It's fantastic. Salem's name has been synonymous with this series for eight years now. They're stepping up to the big leagues, and uh, I tell you what, they're all going to do well. They're going to take some time to find their feet, but the Dane and Wayne show, they could put, uh, really put on some good performances next year. Katie Crawford is going to engineer that team, and it's going to be a steep learning curve, but I think they're going to have a lot of fun along the way. Speaking of pole sitters, let's acknowledge both of them. We congratulate Ricky Taylor and Boris Said, the respective class pole sitters. For Ricky, it's his 10th uh, career pole in this series, and for Boris, it's his fifth. So we look forward to that. Time to roll the Subaru starting grid in at the top of your screen so you can see who is starting where, your favorite drivers and cars and combinations. We also need to show you the onboard camera shots that we have for you today in both GT and Daytona prototypes. So really looking forward to that with the high speed nature of this short course circuit here at the Glen. We always get some pretty spectacular views. Time now though to take you to the Continental Tire. Keys to the race. Cal, what are they? Well, we said we're in that crucial stage of the season. We're into the fourth quarter. Just three races remain when we see the checkered flag here today. This is a two hour sprint race. Very different strategy to the race here from the six hour and very different from a two hour 45 minute strategy that we normally see one pit stop is not going to happen smaller fuel cells this year everyone should need to visit pit lane twice Dorsey weather has been a talking point this weekend well not necessarily today because it's beautiful but this weekend it has well it was horrible yesterday it rained out all yesterday today is beautiful no chance of rain I wouldn't say we're gonna have much anyway a few clouds around but 74 degrees a lot of people here Oh, it's terrific. We said it right at the top of the show. Just a lovely atmosphere. The campgrounds are full. They're swelling. People are having a terrific time. We had the nationwide race uh, just a short while ago. Cup qualifying's out of the way. Now it's time to go racing. Sports cars on speed. You're live wherever you're watching around the country or the world. Thanks for being with us. This is exciting times at this amazing racing venue with this series that's getting down to the business end of 2012. And you've got 23-year-old college student from Florida Ricky Taylor on the pole with the very fast Spaniard, the Rolex 24 and Le Mans 24 winning driver, Antonio Garcia, wanting to make up for a little error that he made at Indianapolis a couple of weeks ago. He'll want to get the jump on Ricky. They all hold firm nicely. And the green flies here at the Glen. Let's go racing in this August race. This one is always spectacular. Look at Alex Popo. Oh, jumps on the brakes there, gets a little bit squirrely. He's just dumped out on a nationwide car a few minutes ago. The 57 car gets turned around and hits the championship leader. Top two in the GT championship goes spinning out at turn one. And both cars on contact are going to have damage. No question about that. I think the 57 was helped along in the beginning of that spin. I'm not sure we'll see it. John Edwards was behind the wheel. Look at Alex Popov now defending from Rowan. He's had a brilliant start from fifth on the grid. These, this is the two teams that are at each other's throat. Starworks and Ganassi. You ride on board with Maymo Rojas. And what a transition for Alex Popov coming out of that nationwide <laughs> series car, climbing aboard his Ford-powered Riley. I think well, that's what he's used to, Dorsey, getting on the brake pedal. and Oh, look at this, second Same week in a thing. row. Left and left rear totally suspension. Up. I knew there was going to be damage. I saw that hit right on the corner, and it takes off the left rear. Devastating blow to their championship hopes. They dug a big hole at Indy. Now it could be game over. Boris said leads the Horton Autosport Porsche of Eric Foss. Look to the center of your screen, 70, uh, 57. Who hits him? Oh, it's Emil Asentado, the yeah. championship leader. 
I knew he got helped along. I didn't know which car. Now I do. And of course, that's the second time they make contact there. The Ferrari's got to be hurt too, Kevin. That's a big hit. Let's take a look here because he suddenly goes to the middle of the road, jumps on the brake pedal, and then that was bizarre, Dorsey. Yeah. Turning to the left there like that. I think he got caught off with Eric Foss in the Porsche, braking probably harder. Watch the 73 Porsche on the right. See, yeah. he just got caught out. The tires weren't up to temperature. Brake bias wasn't ideal with the tire pressure situation there, and he just lost the car. Can you believe that? Top two. There's Mike Johnson, team manager at Stevenson. He can't believe what he has just seen, and he has that sick feeling in his stomach, Chris. The championship may have just escaped them. Yeah, Lee, just checked in with Mike Johnson, and it looked like it was the contact from that second hit with the Ferrari because the damage is on the left rear of that car. It sounds like it is definitely some suspension damage with the car. So Mike Johnson telling John Edwards, you got to get it around the racetrack and back to pit lane because we need to get that car fixed so we can get Robin Liddell some points in this race. What about the Ferrari? What about the FXDD Ferrari? How much damage is on that? And drama here for the 90 of Garcia. Wow, they had a disappointing Indy as well. Broke a half shaft or CV joint. See a little bit of smoke emanating from the left side, Dorsey. Whatever broke there, he was lucky enough that it broke right at the beginning of pit in. If they can fix anything, at least he was close by. This is a short track. It's not that far away around, and the average speed here is so high. You can coast a long way. We'll see what happens. This is a season that has got away from these guys. They've had a couple of victories, been very fast, but just haven't clicked it together. Chris is standing by. Chris, what have you found out? Yeah, Lee, sorry, I haven't been able to find out anything. I just tried to talk with Troy Fliss, but he's on the radio right now with his driver. We can see uh, crew members working back here. And uh, I'm going to check in with the team and see uh, if I can get, get a little bit more information for you. Those signs don't look good there. It was shut it off, shut it down. 57 has made it back. John Edwards assessing the damage. Has the 69 made it back? Yes, it has. It had to serve a penalty, though, Emil Asentado, for that contact with the 57. Well, this is going to be crucial. We've seen this Ferrari keep its nose clean all season long. Going into this year, one of the concerns about that Ferrari was it was a beautiful car, but maybe fragile. Now you can see Dorsey is busted up a little bit. Is it going to be able to hang on for two hours here today? I'm not about sure about fragile. I mean, it walloped a big lick onto that Camaro, and in front end of it, pretty, pretty solid looking stuff. Big Boris said leads the way in the Marsh Racing Corvette, but meanwhile, let's get an update on the 90 Spirit of Daytona. A Corvette. Lee finally had a chance to talk with Troy Fliss and he said both axles broke in that car. He has no idea why, but both axles just a complete failure at the back end of the car. That is very strange. I'm not sure. I, I can tell you for sure. I've never done that, but I've never even really heard of snapping two of them unless there's a problem in the diff and the diff locked up and snatched off both axle hands. You saw a nice pass there from that 59 Brumos Porsche of Andrew Davis down into turn one. He's making up for lost ground. And let's take you back just a few moments ago to the onboard view and also audio with Antonio Garcia. Listen up. I mean, that, that's very strange, Calvin, right there. That's not a high load area. It's a high speed area, so there shouldn't be that much load. That's for sure. Coming through the carousel there, you're in fourth gear, over 100 miles an hour is the minimum speed, and uh, just popped an axle there. But he said that both have gone, which is really, really strange. Meanwhile, the defending race winners, Ricky Taylor, Max Angelelli, are cruising with a two-second advantage over Starworks, Alex Popov, and Memo Rojas, the championship leader. Rojas has just got him as we go to break. See you in a moment. So Richard Petty and David Pierce and, and those guys, I think they're, they're who built the sport, they're incredible drivers. Jeff's done it in such a vastly competitive era. I don't think he has to do anything more to prove, uh, you know, that arguably he's the best or one of the best ever to drive. 
And if you want to know what a driver is really like, simple, just talk to his crew chief. Tomorrow, that's what the race day team does. Sits down with every crew chief Jeff Gordon has raced for in NASCAR to find out what makes this great champion so special. Don't miss it. NASCAR race day fueled by Sunoco tomorrow at 10 Eastern right here on Speed. We are back at Watkins Glen. Lee Diffie, Calvin Fish, Dorsey Schrader, Brian Till and Chris Neville. Great to have you with us live here on Speed. And while it looks pretty cruisy and comfy up front for Ricky Taylor, he's boasting a five and a half second lead. The reason why, the boys behind him have not been playing well. This happened just a few moments ago. The 0-1 is second, and there is the eight of Lucas Lua. Where is the two? Where is Alex Popov? Well, we can show you. Well, we talked about these guys being aggressive with one another. The confrontation to Indy, and here we see the traffic into the bus stop. Maymo gets balked. Look at Alex Popoff all over that inside curb. Gets into the side of Rojas. Lucas is around to the outside there in the eight, Dorsey. Yeah, and that was, you know, that was a doable deal. Alex had the right idea right there when he saw him get balked, but unfortunately, contact made him. We're not done yet. Remember, it's all about a championship. These two cars have the drivers vying for the championship. In the 01, it's Rojas and Pruitt. In the 8, it's not Lucas Lua. The man driving is in contention for the championship, but his new co-driver, Ryan Dial. There's a championship on the line. This is the fight right here, right now. Well, Rojas has got back around Lucas Lua there, so he's back up to second. So uh, he's got some fight in him. Obviously, the car is running strong, and we proved that at Indy, how strong that Riley chassis is. When he smacked the wall, got into a GT competitor and ultimately finished second that day. That was quite remarkable. And that whole skirmish happened because they caught a GT car going into the inner loop and it all got congested and Alex saw a move, made the move, unfortunately uh, not quite enough room. Throw into the mix another championship contender because sitting right behind in car number nine, there is Darren Law mathematically. He's not out of this show either. GT traffic coming into play. Whoa, well done Rojas. Beautiful yeah. move there. Look at the nine car. Darren Law now has got a run on Lucas Lur as they go down towards the in a loop. Let me just say something right now. Here comes the 99 Red Dragon up the inside. But that move that he just got away with was the same move that he got caught out with at Indy. That was a low percentage move at high speed as he made it this time. But look how much he's been able to escape. And this is good stuff from the 99 Gaines Co. Red Dragon. The pressure is on. How are they feeling at Ganassi? Let's find out. Well, Scott Pruitt's been down here watching our broadcast. And, Scott, we talked earlier today about the potential for some blows between the Starworks cars and the 01. We're already seeing it. Are you surprised that early? It's just, that was just one of those things. You know, it's hard racing. We expect a hard race from all of our competitors. So, I mean, when you get kind of jammed up in traffic out of my family at home, that may, those kind of things happen. So, I mean, I don't, I don't see anything dirty. Well, we might not see anything dirty now, guys, but obviously these guys are going to go toe-to-toe -to -toe and make it as difficult as possible for either team to win this championship. Let's take another look at that incident for you. I really like the pace of the 99. We'll have a look at that in a moment. You're looking at car two, Alex Popov. Well, Rojas looked to the inside of that Ferrari. There was no room there. He was slowed. Popov saw the opportunity, got into the side of him, then Lucas Lur threads the needle as well. That was pretty aggressive. Then he gets bought behind the Ferrari. Rojas gets back around him. There we see Jordan Taylor just threading his way through the mess there. I do agree with Scott, though. That was all perpetrated, like I said, because it caught a GT car, yes. and it opened a window of opportunity that a couple cars took. There was nothing dirty about that. These two cars are the cars that went for the win at the Salem six hours of the Glen last month separated by just two tenths of a second and Dorsey to your point it was GT traffic that came into play there and set up that beautiful pass for the nine and Joao Barbosa let's talk more 99 though with Brian Till now John Fogarty and Alex Gurney want to get to victory lane in the worst way they did not have the best car in qualifying John said he didn't couldn't figure out why the car felt good the balance was good they just didn't have the speed they did change a gear ratio that from being here in the six hour they thought that might help them but they feel like perhaps they lost too much straight line speed so they've gone back to a little better known commodity in the gearbox as far as ratios go they feel like they have a better car underneath them for the race chris well, Brian, while we were away in commercial, we saw the 69 Emil Asentado in the FX DD Ferrari come to pit lane. That car involved in that lap one, turn one accident with the 57, and uh, a little bit more damage to that car than the team had initially thought. They were hoping to keep him out on the racetrack, but because that hood was flopping around so much, they decided to bring him to pit lane. Also, a big vibration in the car, even though he was able to maintain pace of the GT leaders, that vibration was starting to slow him down. It was a bent wheel on 
on that car, so good thing they brought him to pit lane, but they have obviously got a deep hole to dig out of in this race. Up front, it's Boris said he has not been headed in the GT class. He leads Eric Foss. Andrew Davis has been dynamic in that Brumos Porsche to drag it from seventh, I think, off the grid up to third. So doing a nice job there, as is this Marsh Racing Corvette driven by Big Bad Boris said. Brian? Lee, let me give you a little rundown on the top three in GT. Eric Hearn, Morissette, they've got a good Corvette underneath them, but they are running a little more downforce than that they had wanted to. It felt like the car was sliding around a little bit through the big carousel, and they didn't want to wear that left rear tire. So running a little more downforce, Eric Boss was right up on the back bumper of Morissette not too long ago. He and Patrick Lindsay sharing that 73 Porsche. They've got a new partner coming in at the end of the year, and they feel like that is going to be pay great dividends, especially heading into next year. As for Andrew Davis in the 59, he is on a charge. They had a problem in qualifying a relay in the fuel system. They didn't get enough fuel to the Porsche engine. The car stalled on track. They lost the fastest lap that they had. That set them well back, but they rebuilt the fuel system, practiced well, and they feel like they've got a good car to move to the front with. That electronics glitch that they had was the first time it's ever happened to them with that car so it's quite a strange experience but there's nothing stopping andrew davis now in that 59 he's on a charge everybody's on a charge this is fast and furious I try and forget it. <laughs> we don't. The closest ever finish in the Rolex series up there at Circus Jules Villeneuve, Montreal. And we will be there in a week's time. You can see it uh, here on Speed at 7 p.m. Eastern next Saturday, August 18. So you saw the gap there from Ricky Taylor to Memo Rojas. That's what 5.9 seconds sounds uh, looks like. And then Lucas Lua maintaining third. Darren Moore is fourth. Fogarty fifth. Jordan Taylor sixth. Alex Popov in seventh has got him, uh, himself up that high ahead of John Pugh. And Lee, the reason for that gap between Ricky Taylor and Memo Rojas right now, Rojas has his hands full. That 01 car very loose on the racetrack. I just spoke with team manager Tim Keene, and he said he's telling him to make some adjustments in the car. But the main reason Tim thinks the car's so loose is because the nationwide cars were out just prior to us. He said that nationwide race puts down a lot of Goodyear rubber, and it takes a good 10 to 20 laps for these cars to try and scrub some of that Goodyear rubber off the racetrack. So at this point in time, he said the cars kind of feel like they're floating on top of the racetrack and not really grabbing it, and that's exactly what Mamo Rojas is feeling in the 01. The other thing is, first talking to Timmy King this morning, he said we had massive understeer through that carousel turn. He said we're taking a big swing in terms of changes here. We worked on it last night, still didn't get it. We needed to get some understeer out of that car. Seems like they've achieved that, Dorsey, but to the detriment of the rear end now. That's an important corner for that, though, too, Calvin, because that corner, you're in it for a long segment of time as far as how long it starts, and also it's a very, very long straight behind it. So your exit speed's king there. How about that? You just saw how quickly you can arrive on GT traffic, particularly at a high-speed section like the S's. You have to be very decisive in your moves. There's no time, there's no opportunity for second-guessing here at the Glen on the short course in this race. And that's what I said pointing at the beginning of the show. If you crash at this speed, if you get pushed off, if you mix it up with the GT car, it's going to be a big wreck. You're not going to have just a little walk away thing. It's going to be a lot of damage to the car. If you've just joined us, welcome. You're watching Sports Cars Live on Speed. Big story in GT. The top two in the championship, the 69 FXDD Ferrari and the 57 Stevenson Camaro collided on the opening lap. Turn one, it was a nightmare. Let's go to the Stevenson camp and hear from the team manager. Yeah, Lee, and since that collision, the 57 has been sitting in pit lane. This team's still trying to fix that left rear. Mike, what's going on with the car, and are you going to be able to get back in the race. Well, we damaged the suspension pretty bad, but the big part is that the upright's actually broken. So we had to go back to the truck and build another upright, but when John came into the fence, he was pretty far out, and we wanted to be a good neighbor to the Star Wars guys, the guys in front of us. So kind of put it back together, got a little closer to the wall, and 
we still got a lot of work to do, unfortunately. We'll probably get Robin back in, let him to get a few laps, get some points. But, you know, we expected this to be a good points weekend for us. And uh, with a 69 going out, it was it was looking good. Unfortunately, we were on the other end of it, and we obviously took a lot of damage. So this, this is definitely going to kill our championship run, but we should be good at Montreal. Yeah, two, tier, two very tough weekends for this team. Obviously, the contact that Robin Liddell had at Indianapolis in pit lane really kind of took them out of the championship. I think this pretty much just solidified it today. And Chris, we just saw a replay of that starting incident and looking at it again, Dorsey, I think Amir was already heading to the left. He came up on Eric Foss so quickly, turned the car to the left and then got on the brakes. That was a very weird dynamic to the car. Now it's starting to make a bit more sense. And of course, after that, you're on a downhill run when you do that. The balance for the car is just not good. Been a tremendous start for this Marsh Racing Whelan Team Fox Corvette. Boris said and Eric Curran Boris is steering and he has a four and a half second advantage over the Horton Autosport Porsche of Eric Foss and another Porsche and Andrew Davis sits third in class but Boris is having it his own way right now. Tomorrow, immediately following the Sprint Cup race from Watkins Glen, speed is your place for post-race coverage. NASCAR Victory Lane, it's driven by Good Sam, roadside assistance, straight after the race is finished. It's NASCAR Victory Lane, everything you need. The full debrief on the second and final road course race in the NASCAR Sprint Cup Series. We are back here at Watkins Glen live for round 10 of the championship and you see the double yellows flying our first full course caution for a pretty nasty incident it was a heavy impact even though you can see there the safer barrier on the outside of the final turn but uh, there was a collision between the nine daytona prototype from action express racing of darren law and joe foster from dempsey racing and uh it was a pretty hard hit for joe it was a big hit. I mean, that's a very high-speed section of the racetrack there. You're about 100 miles an hour in a Daytona prototype. There you see it. Darren dives to the inside there. Well, Joe just didn't see me, and he was clearly in there. Ooh. The angularity was really bad for the Mazda to hit, though. That's a pretty decent slap to the, to the right-hand side of Darren Law's car as well. That's what it looked like for Joe Foster. That's a big one. Yeah, he just float the car in there on the GT. You could tell he was off the throttle looking for the apex, and suddenly the DP filled that hole. And there's the ride that he goes for. That is a heavy impact there. Darren gets some damage as well. As he thumps the safety barrier as well. He is a championship contender in DP, so this is a big moment for his year. You know, once he got off of the racing line into the marble area, there was no slow in that car whatsoever. But what surprised me is that uh, he didn't see Darren Law because he was all the way up alongside inside there. Guys, it was just a little over a year ago that Joe Foster had a pretty nasty contact at Road America when he was involved in that incident with Gunter Schaldak. Meanwhile, Chris Neville standing by at Action Express. How bad is it, Chris? Well, pretty bad. Left rear corner, right front corner on this car. It looks like when it got into the safer barrier, that's pretty much where the damage was done. Uh, left rear wheel all bent up, some suspension damage back there. Right front corner, lots of suspension damage. So this team doing the best they can to try and get things fixed out here. But Darren Law, he was in this championship hunt. He was hoping to try and uh, at least uh, close that gap a little bit here today. But obviously that's gonna, not going to happen. We've got our DP leaders in right now. The Ganassi boys going to work at it. Uh, Mamel Rojas staying in the 01 car going to do fuel and tires get them back on track Brian down here that the Sun Trust camp the 10 is in Ricky Taylor will stay behind the wheel a lot of teams down here including Mike Shank and Mike Shank racing the last next pit stall over wanting to know have they reached the 30 minute mark would they call it they've not gotten the call so they will not change drivers right now it's tires and fuel down here at Sun Trust and they're going to change wickers a gurney lip on the back Ricky Taylor waiting impatiently and back out it's going to be tight. It's going to be really tight. Yeah, he lost like three or four spots there with that wicket change. The one that was in there didn't come out that cleanly, so they lost a couple of precious seconds there. There you can see how he stacks up in line. His brother right behind him. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I'll tell you what. His brother, Jordan Taylor, is running down some very fast lap times. Only a few hundreds off the fastest lap of this race. This should be a good battle when they go back to green. Brian flagged at about the time. You need 30 minutes to get Grand Am Rolex Series championship points. At the time uh, when Brian was doing that report, it was only 27 minutes. Just 27 minutes had elapsed. And sometimes they'll make a call. They're that close to the 30-minute mark. They'll give you the points, but not right now. And there we go. A tweet from SunTrust Racing and Jeff Gordon, who 
Of course, fresh from his win at Pocono, did drive in the Rolex 24 at Daytona for the man on the left, Wayne Taylor of Wayne Taylor Racing. We're back at the Glen, still under our first full course caution of the day. And just a few moments ago, we witnessed these GT pit stops and some good fast teamwork to be done on the left-hand side of the screen. Really great start by the Horton Autosport Porsche. Eric Fox, uh, Eric Foss, well done as he hands over to the lanky Patrick Lindsay. And then, of course, the car that was untouched up front on the right-hand side there, the Marsh Racing Wheel and Corvette. Boris said with a superb job early on. So good teamwork going on there. And also for Turner Motorsport as well. You see the BMW up front. You see the Turner car and the 70 car. They're back in this championship hunt with the problems from Miguel Asentado. If they don't do a great recovery drive here today, the 57 car is out. Suddenly those guys are only 27 points out of the championship league coming into this race. They're going to have a big point stay and get back in the hunt. There's the view from the BMW pace car. You know, this year is the 40th anniversary of the BMW M. And today, the BMW M3 and the BMW 335i, both equipped with BMW M performance parts, are serving as the pace cars for today's race. And just on a separate BMW point, uh, two weeks ago at the Brickyard, you may have remembered, we made a mention about Turner Motorsport celebrating their 250th professional race, all with BMW. They are the second most prolific BMW racing team in the world, second only to the legendary Charlie Lamb run Schnitzer Motorsport organization. So well done, thanks to BMW, but well done for Turner Motorsport on reaching such a significant milestone. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And they're now starting to get full support from the factory and uh, Will Turner and his boys thoroughly deserve that. They're having a good run here. And once again, they're in the thick of this championship chase. And there you go, speaking of Turner Motorsport, we mentioned the top one there, and for Paul Dallalana, who started this race, of course, he had that really special award last year, uh, winning at the BMW ceremony in Germany. Great job. And if you can hand over here, Ian Bill Orbelin could go away celebrating nicely today, and Dallalana will be climbing that championship ladder, as Cal mentioned just a few moments ago. Quick snapshot of BMW's history in the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series, and they have certainly celebrated success on numerous occasions. Look at that, 53 class victories since 2000. We're ready to go racing again. The situation and debris in the final turn right here has been clean, and we're ready to go. John Pugh will lead them back to the green with the lead position. Mike Shank did not bring the car in because he had not hit the 30-minute mark. Now they make a strategy call. They're past the 30-minute mark. They can get John Pugh out for points as we go to green. Let's go. And up front, it's the two of Alex Popov, Memo Rojas. Oh, they've been in close vicinity before. <laughs> They had a great stop there for the two car. Leapfrog around the eight, which did a driver change. Ryan Diel now behind the wheel of the eight car. He's the man who's second in the championship. He's going to try and chase down Maimo Rojas here, but first he has to deal with the Red Dragon. John Fogarty, you're talking about right there in the Red Dragon, who's going to try to get a draft at the straight with her. A little bit off on her speed this weekend. Haven't been able to run at the front. And this is the kind of work that Mike Shank Racing's guys did at Indianapolis two weeks ago to get Oswaldo Negri in the race. And unfortunately, that wet weather and some GT traffic took them out of contention. They were heading for a really solid result, Brian. Did the driver change after 30 minutes, but now they've been held in pit lane for an infraction. So Os Negri in the car and back out, and Mike Shank not happy at all. Well, right, they're barely going to stay on the lead lap here. There's a very short, fast lap around this place at one minute six. So you can't afford a lot of time on pit lane. It takes you 28 seconds. Delta just to roll down there at the pit lane speed, plus the service and the driver change. Now there's too many men over the wall working on the car that drew the penalty for Shank, and it was Michael Shank himself that drew oh. the penalty. Did you see that twitch? Pop off. There's there's Mike Shank, he's not happy at all. He's going to talk about how impressive it is that this Pro-Am driver, Alex Popoff, is really doing stunning work here this year, leading this motor race against some of the best sports car drivers in the business. And he's going to be handing over to Sebastian Bourdais. What did they do two weeks ago at Indy? They won the North American Endurance Championship, $100,000. They got to kiss the bricks. It was 
Fantastic. And now listen, we um, we have just got something quite bizarre to show you about that infraction at Mike Shank Racing. Look at the gentleman in the white shirt. That's Mike Shank. He actually falls over the wall. And gets a penalty for that. Well, no, I think the penalty's already being... <laughs> it's probably a good thing that he didn't get to the official because he was pretty fired up. It looks all right. No worse for the wear. The official might be in a moment. Mike's pretty hot there. Meanwhile, there's some pretty hot racing going on at the front of this motor race. Alex Popov, Maymo Rojas, the 99 of John Fogarty. They've got a good history here. You know, we've never had a repeat winning combination. Pruitt and Angelelli have won a couple of times here, but the same driver combination has never won twice at this short course race. And you looked that up today, and we all down the office looked at you and said, nah, that's, that's not right. And it is, in fact, right. Talk about believing Alex Popov with Enzo Pernalikio pulling out. The thought was earlier this week that Alex Popov would share his car with Ryan Dial. Then he thought about it and said, hang on a minute. You're ahead of me in points. If I continue to be paired with you, I can't win the championship. Alex Popov believes he can win this Drivers' Championship this year, and that's why he got Sebastian Bourdais to co-drive with him here this weekend, and now he leads the race. Well, the way he's been driving the last couple of races, I believe him too. And I like the way he's thinking. I mean, he's thinking like a champ. Why not? Absolutely. He thought it was going to be the Taylor brothers. Yellow In fact, there. the five car has done a driver change. It's David Donahue behind the wheel now, the five machine behind Ricky Taylor. Wayne Nonamaker on the inside, putting the pressure here on Dalalana in the 94 BMW. Wayne's hood looks like it's up a little bit, but I don't see any of the fasteners up. It just must be the way it fits. This is a high-speed track, a lot of air and buffeting gets into these uh, these body works. There's a yellow flag out in that corner right there. A car, there's that car parked there upside, is. yeah. This is for the second position. Andrew Davis leads right now. He did not take a pit stop under that caution period. And here we see the 31 car from the pole. Boris said now up to third. And that was the 56 AF Waltrip Ferrari that was running slowly here. Here's the BMW in. This is for Turner Motorsport. Under green. They're going to need to be uh, snappy here. So you've got to be pretty swift here. You can't afford any hiccups whatsoever. You basically need to be leading your class or very close to leading the class in terms of the gap to the leader to be able to do this service and stay on the same lap as the leader. These guys were practicing their pit stops right up to about an hour before the race over in the paddock area. Dalalana's done. He's got his championship points. He has fulfilled that obligation of doing at least 30 minutes. Brian's on the spot. Tell us more, mate. Well, you called it. They're going to do that driver change, and they feel like this is their chance to get back in the championship. Bill Oberlin said, if we don't win here, we're going to be out of it. We've got to do everything that we can to get that win, and that's exactly what Bill Oberlin is going to try to do. Don Salama calls the shots there in terms of strategy. He told me we can do about 40 minutes. Well, if you double that, that gets you to about the time left in this race. They're looking to do it on one more stop. They had to go past the 30-minute mark to get Paul Dallalana points. They look like they're in pretty good shape. And there is Seabass, Sebastian Bourdais. Boy, hasn't he taken to Daytona prototypes nicely. Quick reminder about NASCAR Race Hub presented by Ram Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern here on Speed. Larry Mack and Matt Clark, they'll recap everything here from the Glen and break down that race to make the chase. This past week was excellent with Steve Burns and his four-part uh, series interview with Dale Earnhardt Jr. There's so much good stuff on the Hub. NASCAR Race Hub presented by Ram Monday through Thursday, 6 p.m. Eastern here on Speed. We're going to get you up to speed with some Grand Am news and notes and PT's going to be back next week. Yeah, the number five team, they're looking at trying a few drivers out before the end of the year to really get to their lineup for next year and tag maybe work with the Starworks group next week. We've got the Grand Am test at Kansas Dorsey down in your neck of the woods in October. And Take nobody's race there next year. Yeah, no one's run at that racetrack. It just got a total repave and they're going to go uh, check it out. We might be up there next year. And Team Ganassi as an organization going for its 150th win today and there's a breakdown of how they got to 149 victories it's an impressive tally i wonder who's going to get it is it going to be rojas and pruitt today or is it going to be juan pablo montoya who's on the pole for the sprint cup series race here tomorrow or maybe jamie mcmurray who's going to get there first welcome you back
to Watkins Glen racing live here on speed and this is the famous 59 Brumos Porsche Andrew Davis after having that electrical problem as Brian detailed earlier in the show sending them back down the order in qualifying Andrew Davis has driven brilliantly to go through the field however he has not hasn't stopped Lee and uh, I understand that it was mentioned in the drivers meeting you had to do a full 30 minutes here today They're trying to clarify a few of the rules now before the end of the season you had to do a full 30 minutes to get driver points but I'm surprised he didn't stop and top him up with fuel now he's got to definitely do two more stops to get to the finish whereas a lot of these other teams doors he may only need one yeah absolutely right they're gonna have to come in and do a stop and a driver change and it's gonna put him in a disadvantage going toward the back it's the wrong way to go around So we'll continue to follow that story for you, but for now, let's go to Brian Till. Oz Negre has a long way to go too. Mike, it looks like you guys were able to hang on to the end of the lead lap after that penalty on the pit road, but what was it for? And uh, is there anything Oz can do other than put his head down and go? It all started because of the 30 minute rule. Uh, we had to keep John out there until the 30 minutes came out, which put us behind on the pit sequence. We get back out there, uh, get to come in, do a great stop, and then we get held and no one told us why. The guy said, uh, the official said we went over the, uh, the wall before the car stopped, which I think is crazy. And so I was like a major league umpire coming across the wall there. So uh, it's too late now. We have video of it. All we can do is uh, push and try to stay on the lead lap and get a yellow. The car is very quick. As you can see, the Fords are running great. So we just want an opportunity. I think the uh, win in the 24 is kind of a curse here this year. Well, I know that uh, this racetrack is known for big hits. It looks like you had a big hit when you went over the wall. You all right? I'm fine. My wife is wondering if I'm okay. I'm fine. It's just uh, I'm more just pissed than anything. Well, there's a similar penalty given to the 99 car at the last round in Indianapolis. Got, got the gain school group <laughs> pretty fired up as well because a lot of these guys try to cheat it a little bit. The car's coming in the store. They're kind of coming over the wall. So it's very much a judgment call, but it seems like they're really tightening down on some of these procedures and these regulations at the moment. We just told you about Chip Ganassi Racing going for win number 150. Chris, does the boss think they can do it? Yeah, the boss is here this weekend trying to see which team is going to do it. And Chip, you think back, you're looking for your 150th win in less than 20 years of racing professionally. You got it pretty hard to believe you're looking at win 150. You know, Chris, uh, I've been fortunate over the years to work with a lot of great sponsors, a lot of great people. and. Most importantly, a lot of great drivers, and um, I, I think it just went full yellow here, so I, I got to kind of pay attention a little bit here. Yeah, I think it's going to get busy down here. The old wines are guys are setting up for a pit stop here, and typically at this time of year, this team's got a pretty good stranglehold on the championship. This year, uh, very unlike the last couple. Yep, they've got an 11-point championship lead as you see us go yellow for the second time. You saw a huge chunk of bodywork on the run up to now. Is this off the 99 or is this off the 46 that's off the Ferrari I think that might it be looks the, like the, Ferrari. The, the Ferrari there we yeah, go there there's the, the whole hood finally the gave hood. out on that you saw that light that was up there's a brand new light and it's a pit closed light so everybody can see clearly that the pit is not open and that is the bodywork damage that we see there it is right there and this is a result we talked about Indy there are a number of problems there the 99 car pitted felt that the pit lane should have been open so now other than a radio call to the teams they have this light and it's flashing like this it means that the pit lane is closed. You pit under penalty. It has to be green. And the Whelan guys built that up right quick after that, and that's good for them. They take care of that situation with the pit in being closed or open. And guys, I've just been handed a note encouraging news. Uh, Joe Foster, who was involved in that very heavy accident in the last turn, has been evaluated at infield medical and released. Yeah, that's great. So that's that was good a big hit. Now, just a few moments ago, there was an incident involving the 99 Gainsco Bob Stallings Corvette and the five. David Donahue slices it down to the inside. They're down into turn one. Great move. They're going to come off turn one. 99 car has a run on him down into turn two. Whoa. Ooh. That was just a misjudgment. He would try to flick out and get underneath his gearbox. I would call it a misjudgment yeah. only because if you spun a guy there, you'd be in the wreck too. Yeah, yeah. going to try and take someone out there. And no he's got a penalty for it nonetheless for involved. what is now, deemed avoidable uh, contact. Worthy of a penalty. You know, that, that, if that would have been a spin, it would have caused a wreck. I mean, yeah. that's why I'm saying probably wasn't intentional, but you should leave a margin of error as well. Similar to Dario Franchitti with Hinchcliffe at Mid-Ohio last week. Just a misjudgment there in terms of clearing the back end of the other car. All right. 
minutes. So what we will do is what we normally do. When we're under caution. We'll make the most of it. Go to a break as we see that replay again. Fogarty and Donahue, the contact. And the 99 was penalised. We'll be back in just a moment. Speed's coverage of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series is brought to you by eHarmony, where first dates have a better chance of becoming something more. And by BMW, we only make one thing, the ultimate driving machine. Let's bring you up to speed if you've just turned on. Boris said started from pole in GT, but look what happened behind him to the top two in the GT Championship. Emil Asentado runs right into the back of John Edwards, that 57 car, and Robin Liddell vying for the championship. Can you believe it? Well, you can see he just got caught out with the car slowing down there, stacked up. Emil tried to dive to the outside, had to hit the brakes, and just nails John Edwards, turns him around and breaks the suspension, and more drama for the 90 car. Antonio Garcia with the strangest thing, he broke both axles at the back, no drive to that car. Started on the front row and went nowhere. And then this pretty scary collision and contact. Joe Foster in the 40 Dempsey Racing Visit Florida car and Darren Law. Watch this. Listen. Ouch. Massive hit. And the good news is that Joe is okay. Then there was a penalty here for the 60 that kept him on the lead lap. Look at team owner Mike Shank who's tumbling over the wall as he is furious with the officials and the call there. <laughs> Deemed that one of the crew members was over the wall a little too early on that pit stop. So that brings you up to date. The Continental Tire race recap. Some important figures there. Now the good news is, is that with this caution that helped, the penalty uh, to the 60 didn't really hurt them in the big scheme of things. They just put out a brilliant stop and they've cycled back through and there they are right at the front of the line. So the 60 is back in play. GT stops. Let's start with Brian. Down at Brumos, it's Lee Keen taking over from Andrew Davis. Remember, they had the fuel flow problem in qualifying that set them back, but the car has been absolutely magic. Keen, magic at this racetrack as well. He's won three times in the six hour. He's won a sprint race. You're going to see if he can win again for Brumos as they get him back underway. I think this uh, yellow is going to help them, Max. I think the strategy had gone away from them by not pitting on the previous one. Right now, they've obviously got a lot more fuel to go on board that Porsche. Hence, they're losing a lot of track position right now to the other guys who just had this top up to do. But they cut their losses now by doing what they did do. Now they're at least back in the game with enough left in this race at an hour six to make a run at it. Yep. And did you see which car came out at the front? The Turner Motorsport BMW come back in, top it off. Bill Orblin's behind the wheel. It's looking good for the Massachusetts based team. We'll watch what Billy Orblin can do in the 94 machine. For now, here's Chris Neville. Yeah, when Daytona prototypes came in, Mamo Rojas getting out of the 01. He was in second place at that point in time. Mamo, I listened to you on the radio that first stint there. It sounded like the car was a bit loose, but you made some adjustments on the last stop. Is the 01 working better? Yeah, it's better. I mean, we've been uh, fighting with the car uh, all weekend, uh, trying to find the best setup. Unfortunately, we were one of the teams that did not test uh, a few weeks ago here. And with the rain out uh, yesterday, we couldn't really uh, set up our car. So we, we're still setting it up as, as of now. Uh, we made improvements, had a great start, and um, I think I think we have a good car. I'm not sure if we have the quickest one, but uh, but you know we'll we'll try to do the best we can. Also saw Mamo Rojas a little bit of a limp when he got out of the 01. Listening to Tim Keen on the radio, he's told Scott Pruitt go full rich this run. Also, old tires on the car right now, so that car should be good once we uh, go green here. Hot tires, up to pressure, ready to go racing at the Glen. This is going to be good. And I'm so pleased that some of the teams who look like they uh, got beaten back down have been able to cycle back through, like the 60 of Mike Shank racing. Oz Negri is at the front of this field. The 99 weren't hurt by that penalty either. We're ready to go racing, and everybody is in play. This is going to be good. Watch for the five car. They've been quick. Jordan Taylor ran a 6-2. David Donahue, who now has the fast lap of this race at a 6-1. The Action Express machine is hooked up. Oz Negri at the front. He wants some redemption for what happened at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. Watch the scramble for second here. Inside the eight looks on David Donahue. Donahue's going for the lead. Can't quite get it. No, that was really tight there down into turn one. But Ryan Dial thought of the big picture in the championship. He let him go. The, the GT field. Clearing through turn one and two as the field now gets back, trying to get those tire pressures and temps up as they head down to the inner loop. But what a great strategy move by Mike Schenk racing. Here comes DL for second. Slices it to the inside. Donahue tries to defend. Oh, that was good. That was perfect.
perfectly executed right there. Outbreak maneuver into the inner loop. Needs maximum championship points. He's two cars ahead of the championship leading Ganassi car driven by Scott Pruitt. That's where he needs to be up ahead. Espen Love really loose there through the inner loop, feeling the heat from Billy Orbelin. I was wondering wow. if you saw that. He was all kind of crossed up back there. 57 back out there. They repaired the Camaro. Just going to try and soldier on, get a few points today. They will more than likely get 16th and last place points in GT, and that means they'll get some 15 championship points. So it's not great, but it's better than nothing. See the Brumers number 59 Porsche buried there in the middle of the pack. They had to take a lot more fuel on board than the other cars that had pitted earlier. But they're back on the same strategy as these guys, but have just have lost some track position, which is tough around this racetrack. Up front, it's the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Winners, Mike Shank racing. Oz Negri leads the way over Ryan Dial, David Donahue, Scott Pruitt, Max Angelelli, Alex Gurney, and Sebastian Bourdais. This is how they run, and Oz has got a little bit of a gap there. Ford Riley's run 1-2. They knew this would be a good racetrack for him. They expect the same at Montreal. And then we get the high downforce tracks where these Corvettes should be good again. But right now, the first Corvette sits in third, and that's David Donahue. Pruitt, fourth, the championship leader. And they woke up Michael Shank racing. I'm telling you what, they woke up Michael Shank with the dive over the wall. Now Oz Negri wants to go. Now we can kind of be lighthearted about it and joke a little bit. I think Mike might Mike, Mike, Mike make the uh, speed center wow factor. <laughs> <laughs> Glad to see he's all right. He did take a good tumble there. The pain will go away quickly when he sees his car out front right now. This is great stuff. They did a great move at Indy with the strategy. Got Oz Negri into the lead there. Then, unfortunately, he was taken out by a couple of GT cars that were still on slicks in those atrocious conditions. All right, let's hit pit lane and find out more about David Donahue. Yeah, Lee, that car is one of the quickest on the racetrack in the last 30 minutes. Listening to that team talk to David since he took over from Jordan Taylor, the team was telling him consistently, David, once again, quickest lap out there. You're the quickest car on the racetrack. I think there's a lot of pressure in that team, that five car this weekend, to perform. We see Jordan Taylor in there this weekend taking over from Terry Borcheller. We also see Paul Tracy in there next weekend at Montreal uh, once again taking over for Terry Borcheller. I asked Terry about that this weekend. He's here working with Jordan. Jordan Taylor, he said, you know, I've just had a really tough year. This is probably the toughest time for me to ever be at the racetrack and sit and watch somebody else drive my car. But we've got to perform, and obviously, I haven't been able to do that this year. Some call it silly season, but I'll tell you what, drivers that don't have a contract for next year, everything's on the line right now, make no mistake. It is. Talking to Alton Soy from Action Express, he said, we are evaluating everything and everyone right now. We want to come back and out of the box strong next year. That doesn't mean you're pulling the helmet back out, mate, does it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Andy Lally's doing a nice job for the Magnus Porsche team. He's running fifth in class. Look at this scramble here, the 70 of Bomarito. Dane Cameron's in the mix. Then you've got Lee Keane in the 59. Look at Keane go right around on the outside there tries to come through on the inside of Dane Cameron and does that was a beautiful move he took advantage of Dane just sort of like observing those two Mazdas battling out in front of him and just sliced around the outside and look Fantastic. now now they pair up four by four or two by two up down the inside going to turn one watch this Cameron wants the inside of oh, yes, oh, just takes the road away from him oh well, they contact one Dane another sandwiched you can't put four into one that's the thing with turn one you got to work it out before you get to that apex didn't happen. Charles is always known as one of the more aggressive drivers out there, and he was having none of that. He said, you're not alongside me. I'm going to take this apex, and it just squeezed everyone down there. A lot of time, Lee Keen, and then Cameron had nowhere to go. That was the fight for fifth in the GT class. It's Boris said, Patrick Lindsay, Billy Orblin, Andy Lally, and then you start with that group headed by Charles Espinlaub. This is what happened. Saw this coming out of turn 17. It started way back there as they all get crazy going into turn one. The big angle with Espinlaub on the 40. 59 gets pinched down, spun around. Contacts with the 43 Mazda. One thing there, Dorsey, they were so far apart. Look at that. Keen's all the way to the inside. Espinlaub's all the way to the left. He's not defending the line. I wonder if it'd even see him in the side view mirror at that point and then just chops all the way across the line there. And you could see right away right there that Keen, knowing that that was happening, tried to pinch down yeah. the Porsche of the inside, caused him to get loose. Watch him right here. Watch he realizes Rio right too. now this isn't good. And then it all starts to go wrong. Everybody oh, hits got a tap as yep. well. Does he have damage? He's one of these guys we're talking about being back in the championship hunt. Well, it sounds like we have some problems with the 70 car. Yep, Jonathan Bomarito coming to pit lane saying he's having a right front. It looks like that right front lane down or bent. So our third 
place in the championship right now. Back to pit lane because of that contact. Wow. One, two, and three. The top three cars in this GT championship have had adversity today through contact. Quite amazing here at the Glen. It's fast and furious, and guess what? We're already halfway through. Quick reminder about Hard Park South Bronx. It's Tuesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific here on Speed when it comes to finding rare auto parts in the Bronx. Joe is the big dog, but if his demanding customers make him late for a special date with his wife, Joe is headed for the doghouse. <laughs> Doors? You've been there a few times, haven't you? Been the doghouse. <laughs> <laughs> I built a couple of them. <laughs> Just to make it more comfortable for yourself. <laughs> You've lost a couple too. Though. Yeah, that's what I mean. <laughs> keep going, keep going away. <laughs> Welcome back to Watkins Glen. You're watching the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series here on Speed. It's the Continental Tire 200 presented by Dunn Tire. And we have got a race for you at the front of this field. It's the Brazilian Oswaldo Negri Jr. leading Ryan Dial, the Scottish driver who now lives permanently in the United States. He's a championship contender fighting with this man here, the master Scott Pruitt in the 01. And he's two positions ahead. That's big time in the points. It is big time because that could uh, really narrow that gap here tonight. And I tell you what, looking at his car setup, he seems to have good straightaway speed. I wonder if they've really trimmed that Riley out because a couple of corners he doesn't look to have mid corner speed he got really twitchy through here in the carousel a couple of laps ago but there you see Negri fighting traffic this is allowed DL to close in on the leader right now you know something that's going on right now the sun setting you see that that's a blinding situation for the driver but the racetrack temperatures dropping they should start getting better grip and some of the handling characteristics should be changing on these cars particularly I'm thinking about the 01 which has been really really loose it should get a little grip right now right there look at that Donahue is much faster through that final turn than Dial whereas when they take off through the S's Dial really takes off from David Donahue before we went to the break, right here at Turn 1 at Watkins Glen International, there was that incident with the GT cars. Unfortunately, one of the championship contenders, the number 70 Speed Source Mazda, was involved. Let's get an update with Chris. Well, Sylvan Tremblay down here trying to talk to his team and figure out what a plan they can come up with for the 70 car. Still, we saw the car come to pit lane, and it looked like maybe just a tire was down or a bent wheel, but there's a bigger problem than that. Yeah, there's some bent suspensions. Jonathan's really doing a great job trying to hang on to the car. And he's talking to us, and he said the wheel's at 45 degrees, barely hanging on. So we're trying to formulate a plan right now. He's circling slower, but we can get all the tools nice and calm. Still a championship that we're trying to win. So we're trying to get points. So 57's had some problems. 6'9's had some problems. We've had some problems. So interesting day here at Watkins Glen. Yeah, tough weekend for Speed Source. That's a shame they've had so much success here, the Master, over the last few years on this short course. But... Uh, going to be a tough one today to dig out of that hole with that car broken. Here we see it coming down. Look at Charles Esmolade. He swings across from the outside. Keen is committed. Jumps on the brakes. Cameron gets sandwiched. Bomberito takes a clip. Yeah, that's broken exactly the right. suspension. Cameron got bounced into to Bomberito, and that did take the uh, front end off. Now he's got to watch out now as the tire wear until they fix that tire on. I'm sure that's what's been. Less than one second from Osnegri to Ryan Dial. It's seven tenths of a second. Then Donahue in the five for Action Express, the Corvette. Then the 01, the Telmex BMW Riley for Chip Ganassi Racing with Felix Sabatis. That's Scott Pruitt. And then Max Angelelli is about a couple of seconds, just over two seconds further back from uh, Scott Pruitt. Then Bourdais has got by Alex Gurney. Yeah, Bourdais is not making the type of time that I expect him to remember the performance he's put in here at the six hour at the Glen with a great podium finish on debut with Starworks winning at Indy. Taken over from Alex Popov. That car's been in the wars a little bit, so I wonder if the car is perfectly healthy, because I expected Board A to be right in the mix here. Maybe he's just biding his time. In GT, we've got a Corvette, a Porsche, and a BMW. That Porsche, that lead Porsche, belongs to Horton Autosports, and it was started by Eric Foss. Great job, Brian. Now this team doing a great job. We talked earlier about the plans for this team, and as it grows, but Eric, last couple of rounds, you guys have seemed to be so strong. Can you put your finger on what it is that has really put you guys up towards the front these last couple of races? Well, Brian, this is our one-year anniversary with uh, the Rolex Series. We came here last year to try it out and see if we liked it. Obviously, we like it a lot right now. Um, we've just been working on the car, and uh, we're getting better as drivers, and the team's getting a lot better with uh, the pit stop. So, you know, it's just coming together. You know, it's still going to be tough. I mean, we got a long way to go today, but Patrick's doing a heck of a job out there, and uh, the Horton Autosport guys, Autosport guys are awesome, like you say. 
Yeah, what can you say? And like I said earlier, though, guys, big plans for this team. There's going to be growth in the future. Look for them to be even stronger. It's about three and a half seconds behind Boris said there is the 31 wheel and Corvette just went out of shot there and they're scrambling down at speed source trying to get that problem rectified for Jonathan Bomarito get him back out and get some valuable championship points back in a moment a little earlier in the race here at Watkins Glen quite a nasty impact for Joe Foster in the Dempsey Racing visit florida.com master rx8 Darren Law just clipped him and sent him into the wall this will show you the impact. Ooh, first hand. That's what it looked like from Joe Foster's view. And as we reported a little earlier, he has been released from infield medical. And Brian, that's really good news. That's great news. I checked with the team and they said other than Joe being treated like a pinata today, that uh, he was okay, perhaps a sprained ankle. But when you look at a hit like that, it really is a testament to how these cars are built and the safer barriers here at Watkins Glen. Makes me hurt from here. I remember those deals, Cal, you know. Yeah, and it's tough for his wife, Claudette, and the family watching at home. The good news is he is okay as we watch this battle heat up at the front of the pack. The Alcar. It seems the concertina around this racetrack in terms of where it's good, where it's not so strong. And further back in the pack, we now see Sebastian Bourdais at the back of that picture there. You can see him coming down into turn one. Now on the tail end of Max Angelelli. Just as we said, what's Bourdais up to? Well, he just set the fastest lap of the race at a 105.8. Four-time Champ Car World Series champion Bourdais is building his resume in Daytona prototype racing. Now we showed you that incident with Joe Foster and Darren Law. That has championship implications on Darren Law because coming into this event, he was third. In the five is David Donahue, his teammate at Action Express. He's fourth in the points. It's gonna swing massively David's way and he co-drove today with Jordan Taylor. Yeah, Lee, and I think when we look back at January, we thought Jordan Taylor was going to be one of the top contenders in GT, but obviously that didn't happen this year because of the problems with Auto House and their inconsistency to come to the racetrack, but you got a great opportunity with Action Express and a good run in the DP today. Yeah, it was all right. It was cool to get the call from these guys and run the Corvette DP for the first time, but it was definitely a big transition from the Camaro to the Corvette, but every time I get in it, it takes a couple laps to get used to it again, so unfortunately that was the case in the race. The first couple laps weren't great, but... Once we were in open track, the car was really quick. Uh, I think I had a pretty quick lap, uh, quickest lap of the race at one point, which was pretty cool, but uh, just glad to hand over the car one piece to uh, David and head to the finish. A great debut for Jordan Taylor. He's got that win in GT at Detroit. Maybe he could be a driver this year who wins in both GT and DP. Brian? Now from one Taylor to another, Jordan Taylor to Ricky Taylor. Ricky, you've won here before Daytona prototypes, both the six hour and the sprint race. What kind of car does Max have underneath him right now? Uh, it's okay. I think we started out really strong in clean air. Um, I mean, I asked for a wicker change uh, for my on my pit stop, and that kind of cost us a little bit of track position. But uh, we changed it back. Our advantage was top speed. We were super trimmed out. Uh, Try to keep pace with the Fords. Um, but you know, we're we're in the back of the pack now. Max is the best guy to tax his way up there and uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, he was working GT traffic just a minute ago. It looks like the 10 set up for the last stop here, guys. It won't be long before they're on pit road. And Max Angelelli has not been happy with the engine. He felt like it might be down just a little bit. Angelelli starts heading down pit road. 45 pit window, minutes man. to go. You're on at 45 minutes to go plus a little bit. That's really stretched. I think they're going to have to lean him out a little bit to get to the checkered flag. I heard anything from 42 to 45 minutes max on fuel, Brian, as you're there for the service. Yeah, I've heard 45 minutes as well, Calvin. So tires are going on. He's pretty close to the wall with the right rear. That right rear tire changer struggling just a little bit, but it is going to be a bit of a stretch. And you heard Ricky say, I did that wicker change, and Dorsey was right on. The track is getting more grip in it, so perhaps right now that taller wicker was not what you wanted to go to. Yeah, that's what happens here when it starts to cool down as the racetrack itself really starts to get sticky and, and you get a lot more adhesion if you can just wait it out. This may start a domino effect amongst the leaders because remember, if you stay out and there's a yellow, pit lane is closed, so you lose any advantage you have. So some of these other leaders may start to pit here over the next couple of three laps. Oz Negri continues to lead for the Mike Shank Ford and then the eight of Ryan Dial, another Ford powered Riley and then the first Corvette of David Donahue in car five and the 01 Telmex BMW Riley of Scott Pruitt. There is nothing between those top four.
back in time to see a crucial final pit stop and Sebastian Bourdais and the Starworks team has beaten Scott Pruitt and the Ganassi organization. Wow, what a move. Bourdais had the hammer down. He set the fastest lap of the race prior to making his pit stop. One half second faster than anyone out there today. And that was the difference. When they did the pit stops, they leapfrog around. This is huge for the championship. Remember, Ryan DL currently runs in second spot. This is potentially moving Pruitt back another one. And Bourdais is fast. It's going to be a tough job for Pruitt now. He gets on it hard. He's alongside him almost there through the S's. Boy, you got to have a good out lap. I mean, this is good. This is a run to the checker for these two cars anyway. Watch these two guys go at it. Heading up into the inner loop for the first time after that stop. Can Pruitt go with Bourdais, considering the lap times Bourdais was putting in before that stop? Remember, there was no bad blood between these two drivers at Indy, but there was a lot of bad blood between these two teams. And this is what it's all about. Ryan Dial is second in this championship chase, 11 points behind, as he now makes his pit stop. Looks like a good, clean one for the Starworks boys. He'll easily beat these two guys out in terms of track position. Coming up to the final sequence of turns. Sebastian Bourdais in the two, Pruitt in the 01. You'll get the idea here as they enter the front stretch. Dial will be going down the hill, pit out, pit exit. And we'll get a true reading on the margin between Ryan Dial and the second Starworks car. Chris? Yeah, Lee, pretty exciting outlap there. The in-lap was also very exciting. Coming up to the pit lane to the, the speed limit line, Sebastian Borde was all over the back end of Scott Pruitt, and both teams were absolutely perfect on those pit stops, but that two-team beat the 01 out. Brian? Down in Marsh Racing, the 31 is in. It'll be a driver change, Boris said. Exchanging with Eric Curran. And they'll, they were your leaders. The 60 has just come in. The leader in DP will be making their final stop. So right now, pit road being very busy. Everybody trying to get that final stop. The run to the checkered. It's about to take place, guys. This is huge for Mike Shank Racing. You heard Mike say a little earlier today, I think winning the Rolex 24 was a curse for us this season. The bad luck they've endured since. Here comes DL. How close is this going to be? They're going to need to send Negri. He's gone now. Yeah. Negri has just left his pit box. But this is going to be super tight. This is going to be really tight. I tell you what, Ryan Dial now is a lap on these hot tires. He's going to take the lead of this motor race. Just great pit strategy and pit work by the Star Wars boys for both the eight and the two car leapfrogging around race cars. This is what it's all about. A little bit of a delay we're hearing on the left front on the number 60 car. And add to that, the fact he's on cold tires, he's going yeah. to lose even more time because right now, as you can see, Ryan Dial is full song up the back straight. Let's revisit the big story involving Ryan Dial. His regular co-driver and car owner, Enzo Potolicchio. They drive for Peter Barron's Starworks organization. They were involved in that controversy with Juan Pablo Montoya at Indy two weeks ago. Enzo said, enough is enough. I am tired of getting the wrong end of the stick. I'm out of here. Literally days ago, Ryan Dial did not have a ride. It got worked out behind closed doors. And here he is leading the race and taking the fight for the championship to Pruitt and Rojas. Peter and uh, Ryan this morning did want to stress that Enzo is giving them su support to allow Ryan to contend for this championship. So kudos for him for that. We're not going to see Enzo back behind the wheel, but certainly Ryan still has a great shot at this championship. As now we see the other GT leaders making their final pit stop of the day. Everyone now will be good on fuel to see the checkered flag here today, Brian. 59 is in leaking fuel only. They will not take tires. That car showing some scars of some of the panels out there on the racetrack. We see Keen with that problem down in turn one. The car looks okay. Andy Lally also in. They did take tires on the 44. And guess who cycles to the top of GT? The number 94 Turner Motorsports BMW of Paul Dallalana and Bill Orbelin. And with Bill Oberlin behind the wheel, that's going to cause trouble for the Here he comes. He had to come. You've got to come. Watch this official. He's out in the middle of the lane. Don Salama said we're tight to get to the 40-minute mark. It's going to be really close. They should be good here. Under 38 minutes to go. They need a clean one. Going for their second win of the year. We've seen problems on stops. Remember the 60 with that hang up on the left front, toss them track position. 94 needs to be perfect. The crew members were actually standing at the wall practicing before the 94 came in, working. This is a five lug nut wheel. Some of the teams elected to go to a center nut on the wheel, but Turner Motorsports elected to stay with the five, and so it takes a little bit longer to get those tires on. Crew going to work, and remember Bill Oberlin said, we've got to win this race to get back in it. He's been magic in this BMW today. Go, 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 go. It's been since 2004 that a BMW has won GT here at Watkins Glen. Good work from the Turner boys. There is uh, the 51, the Audi R8. 
with Dr. Jim Norman, Dion von Moltke. Where does Orbelin come out in relation to Patrick Lindsay and co? Chasing hard in GT. <laughs> So it'll be interesting. Meanwhile, speaking of chasing hard, Bordet has caught Oz Negri. The two Ford-powered Rileys going at it here. This is for second place. Wow, this is wild. Starworks potentially looking at having one, two in this motor race with just under 37 minutes to go here. Bordet is absolutely flying, but we know how aggressive and how hard Oz Negri can be on the racetrack. This will be a fascinating battle. Scott Pruitt hanging tough right behind that, at least watching it from where he sits, his best view in the house. He wants to stay there, I think, because this has the potential to get ugly. Yes. Bordet is flying, and Oz Negri is one of the best in the business. Think about the two roles, the roles that the two drivers are playing at Starworks, Sebastian Bordet and Lucas Lua. Both of their co-drivers, Ryan Dial and Alex Popov, can win this championship. It's a huge support role for those two guys. Four days behind the wheel now. Lucas Lua has already done his job. Let's hear from him now. Yeah, Lee, and for a lot of this year, it was Lucas Lure trying to help Alex Popov win the championship with Enzo Patalicchio. Now, now you're trying to help Ryan Dio win the championship. Does that seem a little bit strange that you're rooting for your car and not for your teammate earlier this year, Alex? You know, as you said, things got changed, uh, so we sit together, we said, what's the best thing? I couldn't do Indy, so Sebastian was there with Alex, they won the race, so they decided they stick together, and then Enzo said, and, and Peter, you know, they said, well, maybe it's good if we stick you together with Ryan in the eight car, and uh, I mean, so far, it's been good this weekend. I have no chance in the championship, uh, because I'm going to miss next week's, uh, next week's uh, race as well. So I decided to come here and help Ryan, and so far, so good. Well, right now, he's cheering for that eight car, but looking at the two, the two is definitely the quickest car on the track. How close do you like it? <laughs> Negri, Bordet, and Pruitt. This is second, third, and fourth. The race leader, Ryan Dial, is loving life. He's 10 seconds out in front, but it is on for second. Speed's coverage of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series is brought to you by Continental Tire. Innovative technology, driving confidence. Some of the beautiful surrounds here in the Finger Lakes district of upstate New York, Watkins Glen. There's no shortage of driving confidence here. Check this out. Wow. <laughs> this was just a, uh, a few moments ago. That was almost a carbon copy of what we had of a replay a little earlier of Bourdais trying to go down the inside of Oz Negri. That was pretty wild stuff. And look at this, we've all of a sudden, we've got Max Angelelli and David Donahue in the mix as well. Five cars going for second place. Meanwhile, Dial is 12 seconds up the road in first spot. This is a battle for second. The five cars you can see on the screen right now, tied together. Fantastic battle going on. I don't want to spoil the party, but that can't go on like no. that much longer. <laughs> it's not going to end nicely. There's our race leader. That's Ryan Dial, and that's what 12 and a half seconds looks like. This looks, this is five cars going for one spot. Bordet has been absolutely flying, but he's come up on Oz, Oz Negra, and he's been fighting for the last three or four laps to find a way by. Earlier, two laps ago, this is down in the final corner. He dives to the inside, gets chopped. He really gets slow off this corner, immediately defends to the inside. Pruitt gets a run on the left, but Bordet is able to defend this time. And behind him, that brings everybody in closer. Take another look here. Down into one. Look at this, just gets in really deep. Bordet is like on his body. Work. Watch Pruitt now, flash. And now we're back live. Problems for Negri, he's off the course. I think the right rear might be down. Could be some damage, Brian. Well, the team was worried about the right front tire because it had locked a couple of times into turn one. There was concern about a flat spot. That is when the tire locks up and slides along the ground and it literally makes a flat spot on the tire. It's gonna wanna roll to that spot every time you break and right now it looks like the right front is down Oz Negre slides to a stop and it's the right front that is definitely down so perhaps that flat spot in the preceding in the following stops just kept getting bigger and bigger worked all the way through the tire and right now they'll have to change the right front and that is disappointment again this team felt like they had a race win and a race winning car at Indianapolis before they had the problems in the contact there Negre sitting in the car just
shaking his head. Got to take fresh tyres here. That's their only help. They need a yellow. He's got to beat Dial out here. Stay on that lead lap and catch a yellow. They need a break now to get back in this game. What a disappointment for Mike Shank. Osnegri battling hard for a podium spot. They are playing the yellow, no doubt about it. Without the yellow, they're sunk. But if they get a yellow with fresh tyres, they'll have a run at Nas put on a show, guys. And Sebastian Bourdais in car two, position two, has three Rolex 24 at Daytona winners chasing him down. Here's the replay of car 60. Watch Osnegri. There's the oh, big there lockup. There's the he's smoke. Gone down. It's already down. That's why he's locking up so badly. That's not typically a corner you'd lock up. You can see there. I thought it was the right rear. It's the right front. Here's another angle at it. Oz goes for a ride there as Bourdais, Pru, and company slice their way through. Heads up piece of driving not to panic and to keep the brake off and make that corner. That used to be a gravel trap there. Now you can get back to the pits, and he did. And all of a sudden, Pruitt has a little more breathing space over Max Angelelli. GT traffic coming into play, though. <laughs> and that is Patrick Lindsay, the fifth-place GT car, the 73 Horton Autosport Porsche. And that allows Angelelli to gain ground. David Donahue's not going anywhere in the five Action Express car, either. Remember what they said, the 01 team said to Chris Neville, we are concerned about the 10 and the 99. They're not in this championship hunt. They're going for broke. And right now, Scott Pruitt has his nemesis, Max Angelelli, behind him. Need to update you quickly on GT. Bill Orbelin has a seven-second lead over Eric Curran and then Lee Keane, Andy Lally, Patrick Lindsay, who we just saw on screen. They're all on the same strategy. All those GT guys should be good to go on fuel, as should this DP field. 28 minutes to run here at the Glen. Oh, Donahue gets to the inside of Maskin with the traffic. Oh, 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 oh. That was tight. Nice. Andy Lally in the 44. Seeing some fire in David Donahue today. This is great stuff for the Action Express team. Disappointment for the other car, but the five car has been flying. David rode, he, did, he looked at that and did that perfectly. He just set that up with the lap car and went right by. What a day it is for Starworks. After the heartbreak on one side of the camp at Indy, joy on the other when they won the North American Endurance Championship. They've got both their cars running 1-2. Ryan Dial dominating this race. Need to tell you about the NASCAR Camping World Truck Series at Michigan. It's presented by Ram next Saturday at 12 p.m. Eastern, live here on Speed. And we seem to say this year after year, what a championship it has been. Timothy Peters, Justin Lofton, young Ty Dillon. It has just been terrific. It's going to get wild in the Motor City. Find out who gets the bragging rights. Noon Eastern. That's coming up next Saturday from Michigan, live on Speed. Let's show you the points as they run right now. Remember, we started today with an 11-point advantage to the Ganassi duo of Pruitt and Rojas. That would be shaved to six it's game on with three rounds remaining in the rolex sports car series when we leave the Glen, montreal next week there's several weeks break before we head to mazda raceway laguna sacra and we wrap the championship up at the end of september at lime rock park here's your race leader and championship contender ryan dial after taking over from lucas lua and let's switch from dp to gt because that lead margin has been reduced as well wow this is amazing they had a 26 point lead coming into this race emil asentado had that problem going down into turn one right now jeff siegel runs in the ninth spot so it's a good recovery drive but these guys are having a brilliant drive this is uh billy orbler behind the wheel now but he shares that car with paul dalalana you see now would be second in points just 14 points out they're definitely back in the game what a drive they got some performance adjustments came back their way several rounds ago and it's made a difference it's got them back in the game and more than back in the game it's got them in the championship speaking of a game look at this david donahue what a spirited drive it's been from david today with his new co-driver for one race only young jordan taylor great combination that's work doors we talked about this time of the year the driver better be up on the wheel because you're looking at contracts next year david's showing what he's got right now no doubt about it oh a little trouble here extra air conditioning 42. Yeah, rear door has come askew. Remember that car was involved. Involved with that incident with Bomarito got clipped on that side. Dane Cameron moved, got sandwiched down in turn one, so that could be the reason for that issue. Oh, she's all right, Saints with four doors. That back door is suicide door. It's trapped open. He's holding the, the primary door in with his arm. Donahue could really help out Ryan Dial here because if he can get by Pruitt. There'll be another couple of points yeah. swinging in the way of Ryan Dial, and suddenly that points lead would only be four instead of six. That could be a full-course caution. We're going to bring that car in. They'll probably black flag it, bring it in. 
make it fix its problem with the door. So I doubt that'll uh, impact anything that's going on on the racetrack. David was in a very good mood earlier today. He walked in. Everyone got a little bit of a sleep in because of the late start. He walked in with a bag of corn chips and a bowl of salsa. And he said, would you like some of my homemade salsa? He's very proud of his homemade salsa and vegetable garden. Sounds like a bad joke. Uh, yeah, that stuff's pretty hot. I know Darren Law was tweeting about it earlier this week. And, uh, that stuff is smoking hot. I'll show you some homemade salsa. <laughs> So the time is ticking away. We've got just over 21 minutes to run here at the Glen. The short course race that never ceases to amaze. It never disappoints. It's always action packed. It's fast and furious. And we've got Ryan Dial leading the way. It uh, appears to be day done for the APR Audi. And for Moltke, this has been a shame. This car has just not been up to speed all day. They've struggled. And now it looks like game over. What about in GT? Is that lead margin coming down? Can Eric Curran do anything about Billy Orvalon? Well, let's go to the man who put it on pole and ran up front for the majority of his stint, Brian. It was a great drive from Boris Said. Yeah, it's not uncommon to see Boris Said at the front of the field, especially here at Watkins Glen, but this car seems to be so strong here. The Corvette always runs strong, and I know you guys ran a little taller gurney in the back to try to take care of that left rear tire. Seems to be going to plan. Yeah, it's going good. I mean, I had a really good stand. I mean, uh, Michael J. Fox Foundation to find a cure for Parkinson's car has been good all weekend. So we had the pole. We've been snake bit all year long in this wheeling team. And hopefully I keep my fingers crossed and we finish this time. I don't know if we'll catch Auberlin, but a podium would feel like a win today. So hopefully we can get it done. I know the best finish that you guys have had this year is seventh. You're looking for a podium, like you said. That Corvette is quick, but you're going to be in a quick car tomorrow, too. How's that Sprint Cup ride looking? Well, I mean, the HendrickCars.com car has been pretty good. I mean, I uh, qualified 25th. You know, it's in the middle of the pack. It's not bad. I mean, a little rusty, but, you know, it's a long race. And it's a tough field, and I'm looking forward to it. Boris said in the middle of the action today, and he'll certainly be in the middle of the action tomorrow, guys. I had the most fun race in my entire life at this racetrack or any other racetrack with that guy <laughs> here years ago. I mean, we had Trans a blast. Trans Am, yeah, man. It was a good one. There is the Marsh Racing Wheel and Corvette. We told you about drivers uh, competing in the Nationwide and Sprint Cup Series. Patrick Long making his Sprint Cup Series debut. Michael McDowell, who finished on the podium in the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Of course, that's his regular ride in Boris. And then several drivers from the series running in the Nationwide Series race that occurred a little earlier today. So some busy boys out there at the moment. To Chris Neville. Well, Alex Popov coming up that big win in Indiana. Alex, your teammate Sebastian Bourdais, he was about 13, 14 seconds back. He's trimmed that down to about 10 seconds in just the last couple laps. We've got about 17 minutes left in this race. Does he have time to catch the leader? No, at this pace, I don't think we're going to be able to catch it. It's a shame. We have the two fastest cars out there, and uh, we're doing a good job. The team has done a good job. We just did one mistake. We were the fastest car. I came in on the... On the on the first place, but it was a small mistake with the bells, and we lost it from first to last place. So Sebastian is doing a hell of a job up there, and he has got it already from the last, from seventh position to the second. We're happy for that, but we came here to win. It's a shame to lose the race because of that, but still, 17 minutes to go, anything can happen. So let's let's wait until the race finish. Yeah, time is running out for this team, but I was just listening to the 0-1 on the radio. It sounds like they may have made a miscalculation with their fuel, telling Scott Pruitt to lean that car out right now. So David Donahue might have a better chance of trying to get around Scott Pruitt here in the last 15 minutes of this race. Really, you don't want to hear that at the end of a race when you've no. got a big hill to climb like here. Well, the trouble is he's in the thick of a battle. He's having to push really hard, so he's need to go in a fuel conserve mode, which will cost him lap time. That's going to be big if David Donahue can then overhaul Scott Pro and get that final podium spot. Here he is, Seabass, former F1 driver, current IndyCar driver, and really making a nice home in the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series. Sebastian Bourdais chasing down Ryan Dial. This truly special place, Watkins Glen, all the way back to 1948 when Cameron Argetsinger convinced the local officials that they needed a race throughout the streets of the village of Watkins Glen through to the early days of the original circuit. And it's embraced everything from 20 years of Formula One to Can-Am and Trans-Am and Sprint Cup, sports cars, Indy cars. It's had four wheels. It has raced here at the Glen. And just happy times. What a great place here in upstate New York.
and huge crowds still come and that's evident here today the infield and camping area and it's just one of those special places it's not just a racetrack it's a destination it's a joy to come to the glen because of what has occurred in the years gone by unfortunately we are under our third full course caution for a pretty heavy crash suffered by patrick lindsay he was collected by david donahue in the number five action express corvette check out this head-on view watch the five switches behind scott pruitt Boom. Oh, and that could have been huge. I mean, it was so lucky that that wall cut right there. I don't think David had a clue that that Porsche was over there. Remember, yeah. David went to the other side of the Mazda and then suddenly was focused on Pruitt, and I don't think he saw him. That's high speed. There's 165 miles an hour in a DP. GT's are about 15 miles an hour slower than that. That is a big, big hit. I mean, if that had happened one car length further back on that straightaway, that cut in the guardrail wouldn't have been there. That could have been Look huge. at the dynamic here. Here's David Donahue to, to our left. And watch that. He's gone around that Mazda. I'm not sure. Well, you'd think he'd see it, but hadn't cleared him. So just a bit of a judgment issue there to clear the GT traffic. Looking to the inside of Pruitt. Remember, too, in those Coyote chassis Corvettes, you're sitting on the right-hand yeah. side of the car Good all point. the way away from where Patrick Lindsay was. Yeah. Patrick Lindsay, on the other hand, I mean, was just a victim, guys. I mean, there's nothing he could have done. He couldn't disappear. They, they were headed for their best result. Yeah, oh, that was a fantastic run for those two young guys. That's a major disappointment for that team. The car has been running brilliantly here this weekend. They deserve so much more today. Now, while the circuit officials attend to Patrick Lindsay and that wounded Horton Autosport Porsche, guess what? Up front, it's action on, game on, because Sebastian Bourdais is now right on the tail of Ryan Dial. I wonder how team principal Peter Barron feels about that. Chris? Well, you'd think his car's running one, two, and feel pretty good, but Peter, you've got your cars up there first and second. Both cars have drivers that are fighting in this championship. What type of communication right now between the pit box and these cars? Uh, you know, the thing, each car has its own program, and, and we have to be fair, but we, we just ask them, just don't don't hit each other. You know, the race fair, race hard, but the main thing is, no matter what happens, we got to keep the O1 car behind us. Well, Peter Barron hoping his cars can come away with podium finishers. That would be the first time for both of Peter, Peter's cars to finish on the podium. Ryan? Well, Will Turner didn't want to see this full course caution either. Bill Arbelin out in front of the GT field. Interestingly enough, you guys are pitted next to the 31 car. I know Boris is down here telling you you should pit to clean the windshield right now. Maybe do a driver change in four tires. But in all seriousness, Bill wants to be out in front. You guys need to be out in front to help Bill, uh, Paul Dallalana move up in the championship. What's going to happen on this restart? You know, absolutely. We need to win this one um, for more than for more than just to win a race, right? We need to put as many points uh, up on the Ferrari as we can. Today they had bad luck, as you saw. Actually, uh, three of our competition for the championship had bad luck, right? The 70 car, the, uh, the Stevenson car, and the Ferrari. So we want it. We want as many points as possible. So we got clean air, and uh, if there's any guy that can make these Continental tires go to the checkered flag and uh, it's Bill Arbelin. So uh, we're hoping that he just checks out and uh, we can get on the podium today with a win. He said he needed to win. That's what he's trying to do right now. They got to keep Boris set from grabbing one of their radios, though. He wanted to call Billy in here a minute ago. Guys. <laughs> and up front, there's Boris and Paul Dallalana. <laughs> hey, buddy. <laughs> Yes, we're watching. Why <laughs> to my family at home? <laughs> we're right in the middle of a period of three races in four weeks. And in just seven days' time, we'll be north of the border at Circuit Gilles Villeneuve, Montreal, Quebec, for one of the most enjoyable races of the year. We share the weekend with the NASCAR Nationwide Series. It's just great to be up there. At a classic circuit, it's tough on brakes, it's tough on the cars, but it's fun and we've had some terrific races. Montreal next week, you can see it here on speed, 7 p.m. next Saturday night. And there is the view from the BMW pace car. We are under yellow, our third full course caution for the day. And Patrick Lindsay's Horton Autosport Porsche has been rescued. It'll be taken back to the paddock area. And that's a sad sight because those boys ran extremely well. If you're just turning on, welcome. Let's bring you up to speed with what has gone down in this race and crazy right from the start. Yeah, Mil Asentado just had that traffic almost backing up to him. They got caught out late on the brakes, tried to swerve around the 73, ultimately clicks the 57. 
but they're on a recovery drive. Jeff Siegel now 6-7 in this race. Yeah, he's multiple laps down, but he's still going to get big championship points. Dorse, what happened to the 90 spirit of Daytona Corbett? Antonio Garcia breaks both axles at the back, something I've never seen done before. I'm not sure, probably a Jeff-related issue, but he's out. And that was sad signs there, and this was a tough break for Joe Foster in the Dempsey Racing Mazda. Patrick Dempsey won't like the look of this as Darren Law clipped Joe. It was a hard impact. There was the first. What about the second? Oh, that hurts. Joe is okay, just to reiterate that point. Then watch Mike Shank in the white shirt. Whoops, slipped over the wall. He was going out to argue with an official. They were handed a penalty that he did not like, but they did recover from that, and then an awkward incident in turn one in GT. Lee King down to the inside, Charles Nassimwell takes away the corner, and you see the rest of the Mazda field basically yeah. involved. Wayne, uh, Dane Cameron, Jonathan Bomarito, damage to both of those Masters. And then Oz Negri in the 64. He was in second place at this time when the front right goes down. That was some of the best racing we've seen for a long time for Oz. Unfortunately, flat spot of that sharp corner earlier. And then check this out. This is what brought the most recent caution. Oh, that was scary. David Donahue slams into the side of Patrick Lindsay and sends that Horton Autosport Porsche flying. And and so, as we check out the Continental Tire Race recap, you can read the figures right there. The most important figure, we've only got five and a half mm. minutes to go. This <laughs> is going to be a sprint to the end. And as Peter Barron said at Indianapolis a couple of weeks ago, when there was that controversial contact, you didn't need to be Nostradamus have <laughs> to tell you that Juan Pablo Montoya was going to make a move. Well, Pete, you don't have to be Nostradamus to work out that Sebastian Bourdais is going to take the fight to Ryan Dial. Yes, an interesting dynamic on that team. You think, OK, all bets would be on Ryan Dial here. He needs maximum points, so he's second in the championship. But Alex Popoff believes he can win this championship. That is why he's put Sebastian Bourdais alongside him in the two car. He wants this win. He wants maximum points. So Seabass will have the message from Alex. Go for it. But as Peter said, we just don't want to see the cars make contact and open up the door for the 01. Brian, can you tell us more about the 73 Porsche? Lee, I went down and spoke with Joe LaJoy at Horton Autosports, and uh, he said he spoke with Patrick on the radio. Patrick said that he was fine, um, just obviously a little bit shooken up, but more importantly, very disappointed in the outcome today, especially as well as they were running early on. They've had a couple of sevenths. They were headed for a fifth, and they could have potentially got a podium. Yeah, the car was really strong, strong in qualifying, third position in qualifying, ran right up front all day long. So that's that's tough to watch because uh, they're only a year year into their Grand Am tenure, and uh, this would have been a great result for them. Patrick Lindsay evaluated and released. Good news there. We're going green. We are going racing. Final four minutes of this tenth round of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series. It's Ryan Dial, second in the championship. Sebastian Bourdais, he's not in the championship, but his co-driver Alex Popov is. Then you've got championship leader Scott Pruitt, Max Angelelli, Alex Gurney, all the big names up front, ready for one final roll here at the Glen. Which Starworks car is going to win it or can Pruitt pull out some magic? Let's see what happens down into turn one. It was a good, clean start for Ryan Dial. Bordet looks to the inside. Oh, Angelelli really deep there. He nearly gets into the back of Pruitt and turns him. They did touch. They touched side to side. GT starts good and clean, at least this is the first part of turn one. Has Orbelin skipped away? I think he had. He got the jump on Eric Curran. Meanwhile, back up front, super start, Ryan Dial. He's got three or four car lengths over Sebastian Bordet as they head to the inner loop. See a piece of bodywork flying there as Ryan Dial heads down to that inner loop. I think Bordet was just being very conservative there. He got the message. Don't take each other out. He had to be careful there. But right now, he's going to get into a rhythm. There should be four laps to go. Looking at the time, there should be this one plus potentially three more. They should just get to the structural line. Three more after this. Good, clean start. And well done, Max Angelelli, after he got in very, very deep. He did some very clever driving to avoid contacting the back of Scott Pruitt. We go back to GT and look at the margin that Orbelin has. The advantage over Eric Curran. And then Andy Lally is taking the fight to Lee Keane, the defending series champion in that 59. And he has won here multiple times. He loves this place, but so too does Andy Lally. He does Lally, remember there. Six hour race here, the car was up in flames. They recovered to take that brilliant win to Indy and get the North American Endurance Championship. They're a team that has some momentum right now, looking for another podium here today. But Orbland did what he needed to do. He took off on this restart, got a little bit of a cushion on Eric Curran, who does have a lot of speed in that Corvette. Two great Porsche drivers will be under orders not to take each other out either. 
update from race control it's irrelevant as far as the front of this race is concerned but it does have championship points implications david donahue will serve a stop and go penalty for contact with patrick lindsay in the 73 porsche yeah that's just one of those deals doors here man it just looked like david just either didn't see him either way he misjudged that opening there on the inside of Pruitt and just took a GT car out you're going to get a penalty for that absolute right this is going to get interesting right here no team orders or at least we don't think so at the front two as far as keeping Pruitt behind is the only order and so far they're looking like they can do that Pruitt has dug deep again he is the only other guy other than Sebastian Bourdais in the one minute five range he's running one five seven here today Bourdais a one five six everyone six flat and above including our leader Ryan Dial so he's been working the magic on that 01 car didn't look to have the speed early on but right now it does have some speed and he hasn't given up on this remember the guy up front doors Ryan Dial winless in 2012 even though he's a championship contender this is, could be his first victory of the year in the meantime david donahue making apologies via the radio saying i'm sorry i didn't even see him there and that's what we thought and looking back on previous championship wins the least amount of wins that a champion in daytona prototype has ever had was in 2006 with york bergmeister having three victories on the year so right now looks like there's a battle between pru and rojas they have one victory this year and Ryan Dial doesn't have any, but he does lead here today. Orblin is in command in that 94 Turner Motorsport BMW over the Marsh Racing Wheel and Corvette. We're coming to the white. One more lap, two and a half miles to run here at the Glen before Ryan Dial and Lucas Lua. White flag, white flag. Go to victory lane. Can they hang on for just one more? I'd say they can because they're looking good. But back here in GT. It's getting a little bit hot. I mean, one, one more lap to go. Eric Kern making some ground, and this Porsche battle is dynamic. Remember, Lee Keen, he defended vigorously there with York Bergmeister at Indy to claim that final podium spot. They started the year with two podiums, have had their lead spell, but coming off a podium at Indy, they may go back to back again. But Andy Lally thinks he's got a lap here to work him over. But Kern is actually making ground, guys, no doubt about it, on Bill Arbelin's BMW. The Corvette pole sitter is coming on. A BMW, a Corvette, and a Porsche. Nice spread in those top three, four positions in GT. Through the carousel for the final time. Ryan Dial, he's won a couple of times in DP competition. Lucas Lua, his co-driver, has not. Special times here at the Glen. Beautiful drive by Ryan as Lucas Lua watches on. And Pruitt, he had fuel issues. Well, that yellow helped him out. He's going to see the checkered flag here today without any fuel drama. But Ryan Dial comes through the final turn. Our championship is alive. And Ryan Dial gets the most important win. 2012 he is back in the game big time Lucas Lua Ryan Dial at the Glen it's theirs and Starworks celebrate for the second race in a row they go to victory lane first and second in GT that's pretty much straightforward Billy Orblin over Eric Curran BMW over Corvette Curran's coming back but the fight is for third for that final step on the podium is the defending series champion Lee Keen gonna yeah, hold Bill. off Andy Lally well done to the Turner Bill, Motorsport sure boys they do it Dallalana and Orbelin and the famous 59 will stand on the podium Lee Keen good job Woo. that's what we like here at the Glen in this summertime race it's like it every August and Ryan Dial, just for good measure, owns the fastest lap of the race. As we welcome you back to the Glen, the eHarmony.com move of the race, the move to the checkered flag, sliding across the line for Starworks to celebrate. At Indy, it was Alex Popov and Sebastian Bourdais. Here at the Glen, it's Lucas Lua and Ryan Dial. Both getting their first wins of 2012. For Lucas Lewis, it's his first Grand Am win in Daytona prototypes for Dial. Perhaps the most important win. That could be the one that swings the championship his way. And there's the overview. Some guys down the bottom of that list had some tough times today here at the Glen. However, we're going to go and celebrate with Chris Neville and Starworks. Chris? Ryan DL pulling into victory lane for the first time this year. Really a sweet redemption after two weeks ago at Indianapolis. Such a frustrating weekend for the, the eight team with that contact with Juan Pablo Montoya. Big hug to his new teammate, Lucas Lure, down here. Gets a hug from team owner Peter Barron. Ryan, what a great run. 
Yeah, you had that big lead there, almost 15 seconds. Then that last caution takes it away, and you had Sebastian Bourdais all over your tail, but you made it happen. Yeah, uh, thanks so much to Enzo for, uh, for putting us out here and having some faith in Lucas and me. And uh, what a way to bounce back. I mean, just unbelievable from these guys. And, and we knew the past couple of races we've been kind of knocking on the door and uh, Lucas did a, an awesome job and we needed this today really bad like sweet redemption I would say Lucas you've been part-time with this team now you get shuffled between the two cars always tough for a driver that situation but you adjusted quickly you get the victory uh, it's uh, very I mean very emotional you know everybody knows the uh, team has been through some tough times last week and now me and Ryan together first time uh, straight victory is a great day for us well, with this win, Ryan DL now within six points of Scott Pruitt and Mamo Rojas. Lee? Thanks, Chris. Yeah, well done, guys. And their joy very evident as we take a look at how GT turned out and what a really special day. The Turner boys add to their victory at Mid-Ohio. They get one here at the Glen. It's a season best, by the way, for Boris Said and Eric Curran. Yeah, great run for those guys. They'll be a little disappointed to finish second, but nonetheless, a great run, and Davison Keane, second podium run in a row. Talking about Turner, let's celebrate. Here's Billy Orblin. Well, the BMW GT drought at Watkins Glen is over with. It's been since 2004 that a BMW has won a GT race here. Bill, you said you had to do it this weekend. You did. How difficult was it at the end with that Corvette filling your rearview mirrors? Oh, he's fast. You know that Boris and Eric are rocket ships in that car. That car is super quick. Luckily, I had one car between us. They prepared. James, all the guys here at Turner prepared a great car. Paul, awesome stint in the beginning. Continental tires are great. Just got to say happy birthday to somebody. And... Uh, Man, oh man, go to turnmoresports.com, keep these four wheels rolling. And Paul Dallalana, I mean, the championship on the line and that win is going to help move you guys up. This team did what they needed to do. They took advantage when things were bad and they've moved you forward. Any concerns at all about having your championship in Bill Oberlin's hands? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, there's nobody better that you can hand it off to. So absolutely no worries. We're looking forward to the next three races. But as with all things in Rolex, you know, getting through the beginning is uh, sometimes a bit of a challenge. And today was uh, no exception. Really, that turn one at the start was... Uh, was a real crazy beginning and uh, hate to wish uh, bad luck on anyone but we could use some good luck and it came our way so uh, Bill took it to the end and, and we're happy to be here. Fantastic. Congratulations guys. Thanks. Yeah both championships are well and truly alive with just three races to go and from 26 points down to 16 and a new second place man that's Paul Dallalana we just heard from him so the pressure intensifies on Siegel and Asentado. It really does but I tell you what championships are made of days like this for the 69 team they recovered to finish seventh Dorsey that is massive points looking at the damage on that Ferrari. It was a tough week for Mazda right then too I mean they had a lot of not a bullets in the gun but uh, everybody ran into trouble today. Time to switch pages. Let's go from GT to DP. And remember, we started the day. Pruitt and Rojas, 11 out in front with Dial and Lewis victory. It's down to six. So it is on with three to go. Tough day for Law, tough day for Donahue. We'll talk a lot more about championship next week in Montreal. We're not finished here, though, at the Glen. We'll see you for one final segment right after the break. Speed's coverage of the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series is presented on speed by Rolex. Brought to you in part by Continental Tire, innovative technology, driving confidence. And by BMW, the ultimate driving machine. And I'm sure Billy Orblin and Paul Dallalana would agree with that after their victory in the GT class, that's for sure. There you can see the celebrations in Victory Lane here at the Glen. Time for more interviews with folks who stood on the podium. To Chris Neville. Alex Popoff and Sebastian Bourdais coming home second today. And Sebastian, prior to that caution, you were just chipping away at Ryan Deal there. But when we went back to green, he kind of took off on you. Were, were you. were you going after him? You just you used up the car? Or were you trying to protect him in the championship with Scott Pruitt behind you? No, I had to give a fair shot at Alex. You know, Alex is trying to win the championship as well. But uh, we had very identical cars. And he was, you know, for sure he was uh, being a little conservative. He had a big lead. I wasn't pushing like crazy either, you know, like it felt like it was too big a margin. But uh, no, it was a great day. I'm just happy for, for the whole team. Now we're going to have Alex Tagliani in this car next week, but are you going to be back for the, the last two after that? You have to ask the bus. <laughs> oh, yeah. 
We're, we're working on it. It depends on the championship and everything. If Sebastian is available, for sure, we would like him to drive with us. We, we have had, you know, great runs, and I think we can be fast enough to win races today. It was a good run for the team. A good, it was uh, unbelievable what, what a feeling of the two cars in one, two, and... Uh, it's just a shame we, we weren't in the first place, but you know that that's the way races are. And uh, I hope to come back next race and try to win it. It's not going to be easy, but I'm I'm getting used to podium, so that's hard because I want to be there already. Well, Sebastian Bourdais has been impressive in this car. In only his third drive, he's been on the podium every single week. Brian, from second in DP to second in GT, Eric Curran, great run at the end, and it looked like you were closing down a little bit on Billy Arberlin, but I think that restart is probably something you wanted to talk about. Yeah, just a little bit. <laughs> it was funny, uh, the 70 car was in between us a lap down, and we went over and talked to the 70 guys. They said, oh, yeah, we'll get out of the way and let you go at it. But uh, the interesting thing here at Grand Am is you can't pass those start-finish lines. So even though he's a lap down, he wants to let me go by, but I can't. So I had to wait it out. And meanwhile, Billy had jumped the start there a little bit, and uh, he was checked out. But uh, we pushed hard, and this 31 Corvette was great today. And Boris did a great job in the beginning, leading a bunch of laps. And we came close at the end, but not quite enough. But uh, podium finish for us is good. We've had a tough season, as everybody knows. So thanks to Wheel, and thanks to Team Fox and uh, everybody involved. So second place, we'll take it. Congratulations, guys. Chris? Well, another impressive run by the Ganassi group. Third place, Scott Pruitt, Mamo Rojas. Scott, for a while there in the middle of that race, that was absolutely nuts out there, and I was surprised to see you staying in it with the championship. You have to. I mean, that's what it's all about. The Telmex BMW ran great. Had my family at home. And, uh, you know, we just didn't have enough legs for the, for the Ford. We just didn't. And uh, they could make a move when they wanted to. If we could keep our momentum up, we could produce some pretty fast laps. But let me tell you, that car, we set it up free, and it was as free as I'd want to drive a car. I mean, a couple times I'm looking out the side window going, whoa, 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 baby. But hopefully it was a good show for the fans. It was a great race. I mean, a really terrific race. And come back in Montreal next week. Well, this team still has the points lead. Lee? Yeah, good start for those guys. It's been trimmed to six points from 11. However, the way it goes in Daytona prototype racing, that's still a reasonably handsome lead. It really is, and that's their seventh podium from 10 races for the 01 team, and that is remarkable stuff. And that's what wins you championships. Pruitt was in there. He recognizes you can't afford to sit back door, so you've got to maximize your points total. That lead is only six points. That will go in a heartbeat. We never get a bad race out of Watkins Glen, and we didn't get a bad one today. It opens up the championship, and it's wide open with three to go. For those two guys there, their first win of the year, Ryan Dial and Lucas Lua for Starworks. And for their sister car, the two we just heard from, Sebastian Bourdais and Alex Popov, they hadn't even had a podium until two weeks ago at Indianapolis where they won, and now they've gone first and second. So the Starworks fight is on, the championship fight is on. Some of the NASCAR Sprint Cup stars have enjoyed this race here today. Of course, their big race is tomorrow here at the Glen. It was a memorable one for a variety of reasons, and as Dorse just said, we never get a dull one here at the Glen at the short course race. And it's a busy time in the Grand Am Rolex Sports Car Series because we're headed to Circuit Gilles Villeneuve next Saturday. We hope you can be with us. You've been watching Sports Cars live on Speed for now. It's Adam Alexander in the Speed Center.